Turn to Romans chapter 5. We're going to begin this morning by looking at a couple of verses of Scripture. We're going to begin by looking at a couple of verses of Scripture. And this morning I want to talk to you about the grace of God. The glorious subject of the grace of God. A subject that is really the major theme of the New Testament. How God in His grace has provided salvation for sinful men. And this message of grace is being lost within the professing Christian church today. Let me give you a definition of grace before we begin. Is that pen on? You're going to put it on? Okay, well, I can't, I can't get it going. All right, folks, while he's getting that set, you go with me to Romans. Now, the reason why we're going to look at grace this morning is because this is the lead-in to our continued study of Jacob's life. It's a lead-in into our continued studies of Jacob's life. As we have been studying Jacob's life, we have found that Jacob was a very imperfect man, right? A lot like who? Us. And yet, we see that this man who really is very unlikable at the beginning, but has faith in God, God keeps working on this probably least likely of all candidates to receive such a tremendous promise, covenant, and revelation of God to him. And yet, the same God that continued to work with that imperfect, weak man like Jacob is the same God who continues to work with weak, imperfect, failing people like who? Me and you. And this is an encouragement. And what allows God to do this is His matchless grace. And I want to set before you this morning, and here's the major premise of this message and it's this that once you believe in Jesus Christ the grace of God forgives you of all sins past present and future declares you righteous and acceptable to him puts you in union with his son Jesus Christ seals you by his spirit with the gift of eternal life and salvation and from that point on God is never going to let go of you no matter how you stumble, no matter how you may sin, and no matter how you may fail, the grace of God, once it gets a hold of you, never lets you go. You know, there's a lot of folks today who misunderstand a lot of portions of the Bible. And they teach that if you sin or sin badly, you could lose your salvation. Because they misunderstand the passages that deal with rewards which can be lost, or issues of the Christian life, or chastisement from the Lord, or warnings to unbelievers. And they apply them to who? Christians. But if there's one thing that is certain in the New Testament, it is this. That once you have believed in Jesus Christ, you have received the grace of God. And you will never, ever, ever be out of the grace of God for all eternity. That once God saves you by His grace, He keeps you saved by His grace. It has nothing to do with your performance. It has nothing to do with your works. And that is the scourge of the church in the day that we live in. Is that pen okay now? I want to give you a definition of grace. Nope, not working. Don't worry about it. It's not working. Don't worry about it. Not a big deal. Grace is simple. Let me, let me just give it to you instead of writing it down. Grace is this. Grace is the unmerited favor and gift of God given by God without any claim or expectation of return. Meaning when God gives it, it's absolutely free, and He doesn't require something back from you. Okay? Grace is not an exchange. It's not a bargain. It's not God gives you something, you give God something back. Okay? And this grace finds its only motive in the bounty 
and the free heartedness of the giver. That's God. The only reason God gives grace is himself. God does not look at sinners, you and me, and say, my, aren't you wonderful? Aren't you sweet? You deserve some of my grace. Do you understand that? Grace is totally undeserving. God does not see anything in mankind. That motivates him to give grace. All he can see in us is sin. None righteous, no, not one. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All your righteousness is, is what? Filthy rags. Not a man on the earth that doeth right and sinneth what? Not. All God sees when he looks at us in our flesh is what? A wicked, sinful, depraved heart. So there's nothing in us that motivates God to give grace. It's something totally in himself. It is his great love. It is his benevolent, benevolent character to give grace to his creatures whom he created and will the very highest and best for them. And the highest and best of God's will for you is not money, not a big home, not a great wife or a great husband or a great family or a great life on this earth. His highest and best will for you is that you know him and land in heaven someday. Because what shall it profit a man if he were to gain the whole world and lose his soul and spend eternity in the devil's hell? If you had the best life you could have on earth and had it for a hundred years, it still is nothing compared to eternity. So God wills his very highest and best for you to know him and experience him and to be with him for all eternity. Wow. How does he accomplish something like this? By his grace. It doesn't depend on you or me. And you've got to see that this morning. Romans chapter 5. Look here. Verse 1 and 2. Therefore being justified. Now you say, what does it mean to be justified, Pastor? To be justified means that God has not only forgiven you, but he has declared you as righteous as what? Himself. As righteous as who? Christ. Do you understand that? How can God declare a sinner like me? A sinner like you? We sin thought, word, and what? Deed. And we do it daily. And we do it even after we become Christians. Because even though we're saved, we still got the old sin nature. We're still in this body. He declares us righteous by His grace through what? Faith. Look what it says. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. When we put our faith in Jesus Christ, God forgives our sins... And he, by an act of grace, receives us unto himself and declares us righteous. And now God is not angry at us about our sin anymore. We now have peace with who? God. And then it says, look at verse 2. By whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we what? Stand. You see, once he saves us, he places us in His what? Grace. And so no matter where I walk on this earth, North Providence, Boston, New York, Seattle, wherever I go, the Sahara, Russia, right? The Amazon. I am walking in the grace of God if I'm a believer in Jesus Christ. Do you understand that? If I'm a believer. That's the whole issue. If I've believed in Christ as the one who died for my sins and rose again, and I put my faith in Him, in Him alone, I'm not trusting the fact that I joined the church. I'm not trusting the fact that I was baptized in water. I'm not trusting the fact that I'm trying to live a good life. <laughs> but I'm trusting Christ in the cross, in the shed blood, what? Alone. I am in the grace of God. Oh, and what a wonderful place that is to be. What a blessing. And yet so many Christians today believe that their relationship with God depends somehow upon their performance. They've got a list of do's and don'ts that some preacher created, right? And uh, they think if I follow that list and then I got a few of my own, 
I'll be okay. God will. And then all of a sudden, after time starts going by, they realize what? I ain't keeping up. And now they're living in guilt. And not sure of their relationship with God, even though they have believed in Christ. Or maybe they've fallen into some, quote, big sin. How big do you got to sin to lose it, folks? David murdered a man and committed adultery, and he didn't lose it. Amen. That shocks people, because they don't know grace. Now, did he suffer on earth for it? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Let me tell you, there's consequences to your sin. And some big sins can have some big, painful consequences down what? Here. But David never lost his salvation. What he lost was the joy of his salvation. When he prayed in Psalm 51, what did he pray? Lord, restore unto me the joy of your salvation. Noah got drunk. He didn't lose it. Lot got drunk and had an incestuous relationship. And I know this is horrible. and We don't even like to even think of something like this. And he didn't lose it. What are you going to do to lose it? Peter said, I don't know him. And he said, it to you, you were with him. I saw you. No, I don't know him. And he cussed. And he was a what? Fisherman. He wasn't of the eloquent upper crust of society. You know, the well-educated Ivy League type with a business suit. When Peter cussed, he knew some good cuss words. <laughs> probably shock everybody in this place no matter what you hear out of here if he was preaching today and he didn't lose it because you can't lose it you can't lose it that's a lie from the pit of hell to rob Christians of their assurance now I want you to go with me to 1 Peter chapter 5 1 Peter chapter 5. You see, because when we look at Jacob next week, next Sunday, you're going to have this message on grace as the background, okay, and the foundation for the message that I'm going to talk about next week. But you need to have a refresher course in this, and for some of you this may be <clears throat> something new. You maybe haven't, heard, you maybe haven't heard grace preached like this before. For what I found in Christianity in my 34 years is there's a lot of talk about grace, but very little understanding of grace, and very few people who actually give people what? Grace. There's a lot of criticalism, judgmentalism, self-righteousness, holier-than-thou crap going around. But, and it's just talk. Grace is just a word to a lot of Christians. They use it a lot, but they don't understand the fullness of what it really means. Well, when you leave here today, you ought to understand it. If you pay attention. I want to show you something. 1 Peter chapter 5. Look at verse 10 to 12. Look what Peter writes. You've got to love this. But the God of all grace. Who hath called us unto his eternal glory. By Christ Jesus. After that ye have suffered a while. Make you what? Perfect. And the word perfect does not mean sinless. You have to understand context. When it says make you perfect, the word perfect, if you were to look it up in a dictionary, one of its meanings, and the meaning that it has here, is to be made what? Complete. It means to grow us up to full maturity as a Christian. The grace of God is what's going to complete us. Look at Jacob. <clears throat> that, was, that was pretty raw material that God had to work with when he first called Jacob. He's a conniver, he's selfish, he relies on himself, he lies, he deceives. Not the kind of guy you want to befriend, yet God befriended him, didn't he? And because he believed and had faith, God said, all right, I'm going to work with you. He had to whoop him, he had to chastise him, he had to bring Jacob down a long, hard road. But he completed the work that he promised Jacob that he would complete in his life. Because the Bible says, having begun a good work in us, he will what? Finish it. You get the picture here? And the scripture says in Psalm 138.8, The Lord will perfect that which concerneth who? Me. And you look at Jacob's life, and as we studied it, we see, this guy, I don't like him. In fact, I like Esau more than him. Right? As we went along, he's just cheating everybody, selfish, doesn't do the right thing more often than not. Why is God going along with him? Because when the grace of God gets a hold of you, the grace of God never lets go. And God, and you say, how can God keep 
working on a fellow like that the same way he can keep working on who? Me and you, who fail what? All the time. If we're honest, we know we fail a thousand times a thousand, and we do it daily. We ain't all that we ought to be. That's why we should stop playing the religious hypocrisy game and just be real and let God what? Work in our life and by His grace grow us up and change us into what He wants us to be. Now look at the rest of the verse. It says, After you have suffered a while, make you perfect. Jacob had to suffer a lot to get changed, right? Yet, while he was going through that suffering, he was in the grace of what? God, right? Whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. And then it says, Strengthen, settle you, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever by Silvanus, a faithful brother, unto you, as I suppose I have written briefly, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God, wherein ye what? Stand. We stand in the grace of God. Do you understand that? No matter how I bumble and I stumble, I am in the grace of God. The Bible says even when we are unfaithful, He remains faithful still. God's faithfulness to us does not depend on our faithfulness to Him. Do you understand that? God is faithful, period. His, faithful is not, his faithfulness to me is not conditioned on my faithfulness to Him. And thank God, because I've been a Christian 34 years, and I haven't always been faithful. I've tried, and sometimes I haven't tried too hard. And I've, so I love Jesus, but there was times I loved my sin and my stupidity and my folly and my own plan more than I loved the Lord. But guess what? He just kept working on me. If He had to whoop me, give me a good whooping. Right? Take me out to the woodshed. That's my father, right? But correct me, rebuke me, get me back in line. But I want to tell you something. His grace has never failed me. And the same for you, my brother and sister. No matter what we do, he, he is not going to remove us from his grace. We stand in the grace of God and thank God. Because that means with all my failures and weaknesses, in foolishness and folly, he ain't going to give up on me. And why? Because of what Jesus did at Calvary. Now, let me talk about something here for a minute. While I'm, well, before I say this, I want you to just turn me. I want you to turn me and go over, if you will. And I want you to go, if you will, to John chapter 19. Okay? Now, stick with me this morning. Uh, Concentrate, focus, be disciplined. And if you can't concentrate and focus, just behave yourself and play poker. That means make believe you're paying attention if you don't want to. So as not to disturb anyone what else. Because there are people who are interested in what I'm going to talk about. If you're not... Just play poker and don't let on that you're not interested. John chapter 19. Okay, we're going to look at something. Okay, and uh, you know, the amazing thing, folks, is that Today, I, I kind of get tired of all these pipsqueak religionists in the church because Christianity is about how God's grace reached down to man, okay? And how God's grace reached down to man and saved man, all righty? But... Religion is how man, by his efforts, has to earn his way to God. Do you understand what we're talking about? Religion is man, by his works and by his efforts, earning, trying to earn his way to God. But Christianity is about how God's grace 
has done for man what man could not do for himself. Okay? I can't earn my way to heaven because I sin. And no matter how much good I do, it doesn't make up for my sins. Those sins have to be paid for. So God undertook the task by His grace of paying my sin debt in your sin debt. And that's why He sent Jesus to the cross. And you say, what motivated Him? Love. Love motivated Him. Now, folks, I get tired of looking all the pipsqueaks in the church today preaching religion. They talk about grace, but they don't know anything about grace. They're always peddling this gospel of works, human righteousness, preaching at people of what you've got to do, 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 do for God. And it's an insult to the grace of God. And it is a monument to the apostasy of the day that we live in. We've got the, from the hyper-Calvinist, Lordship Salvationists, to the lose your salvation, holy roller crowd that has pervaded the emotional movements of Pentecostalism and the charismatics that teach people you can lose your salvation and have all these crazy rules, you know, like uh, women can't wear makeup and pants and earrings you know and I just wonder you really think God cares about that preacher come on now that's what God's worried about some woman got some makeup on to make her look better heck even an old bond looks better with paint come on come on and I didn't mean that as an insult though you, you might have you, I didn't mean an insult I meant um, well whatever Sometimes it's better to just shut up and not talk because you just get in more trouble the more you talk, right? But, and then to the what? The rigid fundamentalist, the legalist crowd, you know? In fact, you know, I want to show you something. Go to James. Uh, forget John, go to James. I want to show you something. Go to the book of James, all right? Now, listen, folks, listen to me. I, I, get, I get very frustrated with it. Because it's not real. It's human beings trying to make believe how spiritual and good they are. Amen. And if that's the case, then what do you need Jesus for? We, we ain't very good. And we ain't all that spiritual. We always think we're farther along than we really are. Okay? You know, folks, and, and I, get, I get frustrated with them because they're preaching nothing more than salvation by works. Another gospel. Paul calls it another gospel and a perversion of the gospel. Look at James chapter 2. Look at verse 10. How could a human being ever make themselves righteous to God by their what? Performance. Well, I don't drink wine. I don't watch TV. I don't listen to that rock and roll music preacher. So I'm a pretty good person. Really? Do you... Jealous of your neighbor? Are you proud and arrogant? Have you told some white lies? Hmm? You got bitterness in your heart, resentment, unforgiveness, gossip, slander. You like to hear bad things about people so you can run around and tell others. Oh, you can see, there's a lot of sins you can't see. And listen, there ain't nothing wrong with. Things that the Bible says what? Nothing about. If the Bible doesn't say it's sin, then you're free to what? Participate. Always with the understanding that, is it going to hinder me? Is this going to hinder me? Then I don't do it. And if it's going to hurt my brother or sister, because if, if, if my liberty hurts my brother and sister, I don't what? Do it. Okay? Now look here at verse 10. For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point is guilty of what? All. all. See, you can, if you look at God's law, and that's what it's talking about here, you keep it all and you miss one, you're guilty of what? Everything. Because if you want to be acceptable to God by your performance and your behavior, you have to be as perfect as God is. And can you? No. That's why Jesus went to the cross. Okay? So think about it. How could any person ever think that somehow by their 
behavior, they're earning God's what? Acceptance. Or improving on their position with God. If it requires that you be perfect, guess what? Then nobody can do it. Right? You could live 90 years, and this is impossible, but you know, go along with me, and not sin your whole life. And then on your deathbed, have one bad thought. Impossible to happen. You, you're going to blow it way before that. Okay? A million times before that. But if you did, in your deathbed, one bad thought, that's enough. Get, keep the whole law guilty what? Fail in one point, guilty of what? All. Oh. How could a human being possibly think there's something I can do to make myself acceptable to a holy God? It has to be by what? Grace. Okay? Now, the gospel is a good news, but there's a lot of enemies of the cross today. Who I don't know what the problem is. Either pride or self-righteousness or wanting to be holier than thou. Or maybe they're afraid people will live wicked if you tell them how great God's grace is, and that's not the truth. What I have found is when you tell God, people how great God's grace and forgiveness and love is, they only want to serve Him what? More. Beloved, here is, herein is love. Not that we loved God, but that He loved what? Us and sent His Son as the propitiation for our sins. You see, when you find out how much God loves you, you want to reciprocate what? Love back and serve Him. But when you tell people, if you don't do this, God's angry with you. God won't accept you. All you do is put them under fear and bondage. And rather than drawing near to God, in their guilt and fear, they what? Sneak away from God. They crawl away from Him. See, love begets what? Love. When you understand God's grace towards you, and His patience with you, His mercies towards you, His forgiveness and His abounding grace, it draws you what? To Him. You want to serve that kind of what? God, are you with me today? So the gospel is the good news of the matchless grace of God through Christ's cross. It's good news. It's the good news that God has settled the sin issue once and for all and forever 2,000 years ago on the cross. It's the news that what God required for men and women to be saved, God provided. Only God can meet his own demands against sin. And on the cross, God did it. What God demanded had to be done for men to be saved and forgiven, God provided it at the cross. It had nothing to do with what? You and I. Did you help God with the cross of Jesus? No. And that's what he required. God did it what? All. That's called what? Grace. Now listen to me. Jesus, when he died on the cross, what did he say when he, before he gave up the ghost? He said, it is what? Finished. Finished. Tetelestai. Paid what? In full. He paid our sin debt perfectly. And then he died, gave up the spirit, was buried, rose again on the third day, ascended back into heaven, and the Father received him. And he's coming again to judge the living and the dead. But if you've believed in Jesus Christ as your Savior... You are forgiven, you are declared righteous, you are a son of God, and you are in his grace forever. And you don't have to fear that day because the Bible says fear has what? Torment. Okay? You don't have to fear that day. And, and folks, listen. I want to show you something. Go, go, to, go oh, you're, you're close to Revelation. Just flip over a couple books. You know, and I, and I don't get what people can't get about this. Because the longer, go to Revelation 21, I want to show you something. The longer I've been a Christian, the more God reveals to me how bad I am in my flesh. I know I got a new nature. I know I got this side of me that wants to do right. Like Paul said, I, 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 with my mind I want to serve the Lord, but with my flesh I serve what? Sin. Romans 7, right? The battle between the flesh and the spirit. I mean, you know what? You, as you grow as a Christian, yeah, you, you can overcome those outward sins pretty quick. But then you start to understand the inward sins about your heart, the arrogance, the pride, 
the indifference, the lack of love, the lack of compassion for others, the little pettiness, the resentment, the critical spirit you have. The, you know what I'm saying? And, and, and you start to see there are sins not only that of commission that you do, there are sins of omission. Things you ought to have done, but you just omitted them. You didn't do them. And if you start to really look at your heart, you start to see it's bad. I know I got a new nature, but I also got this old nature that's bad. And it's never going to improve. And I say, how do people ever think that by doing something, they're going to make themselves acceptable to God or keep themselves acceptable? Because what I'm talking about today is this. God not only saves by His grace, He keeps you saved by His grace. Do you understand that? Amen. Let, me, let, me, let me show you something. But here's the thing, though. Notice salvation is free. Revelation 21, verse 6. Look what it says. And he said unto me, it is what? Done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. That's Jesus talking. I will give to him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life. What? Free. Freely. Revelation 22, 17 says... Whosoever will, let him come and take of the water of life, what? Freely. It's free. It's a gift. We don't earn it by our performance. We don't keep it by our performance. Go to Jude. I'm going to show you a verse in Jude. Right before Revelation. The book right before the Revelation. There's only one chapter. Folks, we don't do anything to keep ourselves saved. When we got saved, we didn't do anything. Jesus did it all at the cross. We simply believed. And now that we got saved, we don't do anything to keep ourselves saved. He does it. Look at Jude. Look at verse 1. It says, Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and the brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father, and that's positional sanctification, how God placed us positionally in Christ. And what does it say? preserved in Jesus Christ and called. He preserves us. When you preserve something, you know, have you ever done that? Like I do that now, summer's here, growing the garden, coming the fall, I'll be gathering up stuff and preserving it in jars. You know, I like doing that stuff. What, what does it mean to preserve something? It means to put it in a condition that it will what? Be safely kept, right? When God preserves us, what's he doing? He's keeping us safe, Right? He's keeping us safe in His what? Grace. He preserves us. We don't keep ourselves. He keeps us. The same grace that He gave to us the moment that we believed, He keeps exercising that grace because we stand in His grace. And that grace what? Preserves us. It keeps us safe forever. You get the picture? Isn't that awesome? That's an awesome thing. All right, now, I want you to go with me. And I want you to go... If you will, to Hebrews, if you will. Hebrews chapter 10. Just flip back a couple books now. Now, you know, think about it. The gospel is the good news that God has done everything to forgive you and I of our sins, to save us, and to keep us saved and land us in heaven safely. Now, can I repeat that? The gospel is the good news that God has done everything that is required to forgive us of our sins, to save us, and to keep us saved and land us in heaven safely if we'll believe in Him. Do you see that? That's the good news. And it doesn't depend on our what? Efforts, our performance. Do you see this? You know, we, Jude, Jude just says, preserved, preserved in Christ Jesus. You know, folks, you go to church and you hear people sing. All, you ever think about all the hymns that are sung in churches? This morning they're being sung. And I wonder, why don't people understand? Well, many preachers don't understand. You've heard that hymn, grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that is greater than all our what? Sin. Great old hymn, isn't it? Then you've heard... One of my favorites, Amazing Grace shall always be my song of praise. For it was grace that bought my liberty. I do not know how he could have loved me so. 
but he looked beyond my faults. He saw my need. What a wonderful hymn. What a wonderful song, gospel song. We sing, Come thou fount of every blessing. Turn my heart to sing thy praise. Streams of mercy never ceasing. Call for songs of loudest praise. Streams of mercy never what? Ceasing. Never ceasing towards us. Then there's another one of my favorites. It's leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. I'm leaning, I'm leaning, safe and secure from all alarms, leaning on the everlasting arms. Safe in what? Secure. The other song, uh, How Firm a Foundation, the soul that on Jesus has leaned for repose. God says, I will not, I will not desert to his foes. That soul, though all hell should endeavor to shake, I will never, never, no, never forsake. Isn't that awesome? Well, you, you ever listen to these lyrics in these songs? These are awesome. How about this one? Never failed me yet. Never failed me yet. Jesus' love has never failed me yet. This one thing I know, that wherever I go, Jesus' love has never failed me yet. Isn't that awesome? And of course, finally, we could, sit, we could keep bringing out many of these hymns, right? About God's grace. You know, the big one. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound, right? And then there's a stanza that says, Through many dangers, toils, and snares, <clears throat> we have already come. T'was grace that brought us safe thus far, Tis grace will lead us home. In other words, I've gotten this far. 34 years of serving the Lord. Not by John Ritchie's power or effort. God got me safe this far. And you know, whatever time I got left, God's going to take me the rest of the way by his what? Grace. And the same for you if you've what? trusted him he's preserving us in his grace and yet we sing all these hymns about the grace of God and yet the grace of God is one of the least understood subjects in the church there was a fellow I want to read something to you that I learned a lot from as I was studying the Bible in fact it was his little booklet on salvation the doctrinal analysis that set me free from six years of living in a Pentecostal hell, okay? Nice people, but legalism over the head. Like you, and every Sunday, people who got saved last Sunday were getting saved again because during the week they did what? Yeah, not, not, listen, not every Pentecostal church is like this, and I'm not trying to paint every Pentecostal church bad, but there is a doctrine in Pentecostalism that is if you sin, you can lose your salvation. And they really don't... I mean, I remember Pentecostal preachers saying salvation is by God's grace and it's free. doesn't matter what you've done or where you've been. God will forgive you. Come and be saved. And then he said, while it's free, once you get it, it'll cost you everything. How is it free? That ain't grace. And I'm going to tell you something. Dr. Schaefer understood the grace of God. And when I started studying from him through the Bible college that I studied from, my heart was set free to understand what grace is about. Dr. Schaefer wrote this back, oh my God, 60, 70 years ago. He said, The continued exercise of God's grace towards the Christian is the one and only basis upon which he may hope to endure. In other words, the only reason I'm landing in heaven is because God's grace will never what? Let me go. For as certainly as grace is the one and only basis upon which God can save a meritless sinner, so certainly grace alone is the basis upon which God can righteously keep him saved. Having begun in the Spirit, or wholly in the power and the grace of God, there is no hope for continuance to be found in the flesh or in our own strength. Wow, what a statement. That means... When God saves me by grace, 
He continues to exercise grace for towards me no matter how I mess up. And He keeps me saved because of the blood of Jesus. Do you understand this? When God saves us, He keeps us saved because Jesus satisfied every demand. You say, see, what people today in Christianity, it bugs me. They're so sin conscious. Now, don't get me wrong. I preach about sin and I preach against sin. And we want to live right and we want to live holy. But the fact of the matter is our flesh, we fall and we do sin. But the good news is that we're forgiven through the blood of Christ. And today in the church, people are so focused on sin, they're sin conscious. They're not sun conscious. Okay? Listen, at the cross, God did something with your sins. He punished Christ for them. And when you believed, he forgave you all of them. And he says, their sins and iniquities, I remember what? No more. No more. Now, you understand in this? So, why are people so focused on their sins and failures? That can only produce what? More misery. Get your eyes on Jesus and what he's done for you. You starting to get the picture here? Now, Hebrews chapter 10, look at verse, if you will, 10 to 14. It says, about Christ, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Now notice how we're sanctified. Through the offering of the body of Jesus what? Christ. You know, there's a doctrine in certain churches called, uh, they say you get saved and you get sanctified. And they say the second experience is the sanctification. That's what makes you real holy. Right? Now, experiential sanctification is a process of growth. We understand that. But notice, and that's something we participate in with God. But this says we're sanctified through the what? Cross. That means it has nothing to do with me. If I'm a believer in Christ, I'm already sanctified. Because I'm in Christ. I'm, sanctified means to be set apart, to be made holy. God has set me apart and made me holy, not because of who I am, but because of what Christ did. Do you understand this? This is all grace. Now, and then it says, once for what? All. Happens one time. Keep reading. And every priest stand at daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. Any religion that has a priest offering a sacrifice for sin is just foolishness. Because there's only one what? Sacrifice. But this man, Jesus, after he offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of what? God. From henceforth, expecting till his enemies be made his what? Footstool. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Do you see what it says now? It says we were sanctified through the offering of Christ. I didn't have anything to do with it. Jesus sanctified me. Okay? And then it says those that were sanctified are now perfected for what? Ever. Do you know why I'm perfected forever? Because I've been justified by faith. And I've been placed in Christ. And now... God has given me his own righteousness. Okay? And now because I'm in Christ and I have God's righteousness, I am perfectly acceptable to God. Is Jesus perfectly acceptable to God? Our believers in Christ? When God looks at the believer, whose righteousness does he see? Does he see our own or does he see Christ's? Because we've been baptized into the body of what? Christ. By the Spirit. Because we're in Christ, we possess the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Def, can you improve on God's righteousness? Can you improve on Jesus? Do you realize that God, if you believed in Jesus as your Savior, God looks at you as he looks at who? Jesus. Do you realize you're standing before God because you are in Christ? Is Christ himself? Now, is Christ perfectly acceptable to a holy God? Can you improve on the righteousness of Jesus? No. no. How can you improve on perfection? So when it says, because those who have been sanctified are perfected forever, what it's saying is because we are now in Christ, because we believe in what he did on that cross for us, we are now perfectly forgiven and perfectly accepted by God forever, even though we know daily we stumble. We still sin, we still fail, we still mess up. But he has what? Forgiven us 
and made us perfected forever. It doesn't depend on us. That's called grace. Now, is this starting to hammer through the thick religious skull that we possess? Okay, now listen. I want to go on. I want you to go to 1 John, if you will. Again, flip back towards the book of Revelation. Right after 2 Peter, you'll see 1 John. And I want to show you something, because this is so important. I'm going to make a statement now. I'm going to make a statement. Now listen to this. Human, human ability, human performance, human strength cannot maintain a right standing before God. In the same way that I can do nothing to receive his initial grace and forgiveness, by the same token, after I've received his grace and forgiveness, there's nothing I can do to what? Keep it. You get that point? He just keeps giving it what? To me. You see? Now you say, how can God, how can God go on with people who he knows still sin and fail. He's perfect. He's perfectly holy. He's perfectly righteous. How The question becomes, how can God... I could ask myself that. Lord, how do you... How can you I know the answer, but think about it. <laughs> if not, we're in all, all in a mess of trouble this morning, right? But how can you, Lord, continue to work in me and go on with me even though you know I still sin and fail. Look at 1 John chapter 2 and look what it says. Verse 1 and 2. Here's why. <clears throat> My little children, these things write I unto you that you sin not. Now, it's not God's will that we sin, right? But the fact is that we still what? Do. But it's, even though we sin... It's not because God said it's my will that you sin. It's our what? Bad choice, right? God's not trying to encourage us to sin. But what he's telling us is, when you do sin, I've got a solution. You ought to write down in your Bible, right next to this passage, God's solution for the believer's sin. Right? God's solution for the believer's sin. Okay? And this is the reason why God can go on with us and keep giving us grace, even though after we've been saved and saved for many years, we know that we still sin and fail. Look what it says. It says, my little children, these things I write unto you that you sin not. And if any man sins, he admits that we what? We do sin. We have a what? An advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. So the first thing is... Jesus Christ is my advocate. The word advocate comes from a Greek word, parakleton. It means to stand on behalf of. It's often used to refer to a defense attorney. When I sin and fail, God is telling me, don't sweat it. I've got a defense attorney for you. His name is what? Jesus. He's your advocate. He stands on your what? Behalf. He pleads your what? Case. Hypothetical. I sin and stumble today. It's going to happen, right? Thought, word, or deed. I feel lousy about it. What's God say about it? I've forgiven you. Don't sweat it. I'm not condemning you. Why, Lord? Jesus is your what? Defense attorney. The devil stands in heaven condemning me and accusing me. And Jesus stands and pleads his what? Shed blood on my what? Behalf. He's my advocate. He keeps me saved even though I still sin and fail after I became a Christian. Do you get the picture? But now keep going. Why, why can Jesus do this job of advocate? Look at verse 2. Look what it says. And he is the propitiation for our sins. That means the sins of who? Believers. And not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole what? World. But the first thing he says, he's our advocate, and he can be our advocate because he's the propitiation for our what? Sins. 
Propitiation means simply this, to satisfy by paying what? A price. God's wrath and His anger and His judgment is directed against our what? Sins, right? But at the cross, what God did is He took the wrath and the anger and the judgment that was directed towards our sins and us and placed it where? On Christ. And Jesus said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Right? Eloi, Eloi, lama sabbathani. At that moment, the Father turned the back on the Son and He imputed upon the Son the sins of the world and He unleashed His what? Wrath on Jesus. And Jesus suffered for every vile, wicked act of sin that mankind could ever commit. Now, then He said, It is what? Finished. Paid in full. Meaning that God's anger was now what? Satisfied. God's justice executed the sentence and the demands of God's righteousness so perfectly that God's anger is not directed towards our sins. Why? Because somebody has already what? Took the anger and the punishment and the wrath and the judgment for us. You know, when we sin, do you know why we feel guilty? Because we think somebody's got to pay for that. And as Christians, we fail to realize somebody already paid for it. Our forgiveness comes freely. Isn't that what he said? Take of the water of life freely. Nothing you can do to earn this forgiveness. But now here's the thing. God can continue to go on with us who sin and fail. Christians, believers who are saved, who trust in Christ... Even though we sin and fail, God never gives up on us and He can keep going on with us and working in our lives, trying to change us, right? And bless us, even though we sin. And He can do that because He's not upset about the believer's sins anymore. Because Christ is the propitiation for our sins. You get the picture? Christ took the judgment. He satisfied the wrath in the demands of God's righteousness against our sins. He now, you know how I know this is true? Because it says he stands as my what? Advocate. Not my what? Accuser. In heaven right now, if we all sinned, all of us believers right now sinned this moment, Jesus is standing on our behalf. He's, but some Christians think he's pointing at us and saying, I know what you did and I'm going to get you for it. No. You see, our sins are not an issue if we've trusted what? Christ. He is the propitiation for our sins. God's wrath has been satisfied. Now that, listen, this, I, I, this is a tough concept to communicate to people who have always been taught that God accepts you by your performance. Be a good boy and girl, Johnny. You know, and, and, and you'll be rewarded. You know, oh, Johnny and Jill, is it right? Be a good boy and girl, you'll get rewarded. In your whole life, you're judged by your performance. But here's the thing. Think of this now, and, and don't miss this as we tie this together. God exercises His grace towards us and keeps giving us this grace, which has nothing to do with our performance, because His anger against our sins is re what? removed. Now, this troubles legalistic people. This troubles religious type people, okay? This troubles the holier than thou, arrogant, proud, self-righteous type. I'm going to make a statement. As a believer, your sins do not upset God. How can, he, how can your sins upset God? Christ, it says, is the propitiation, and now he's your what? Advocate. And the other scripture in Hebrew says he's our intercessor. He's our defense attorney and he's praying for us. He's not pointing a finger at us, accusing us. And yet a lot of preachers make Christians feel as if when they sin and fail, the Lord's going, you, you're no good, you scoundrel. I got it in for you unless you straighten out. You see? And making them feel guilt and bondage when the scripture actually says the exact opposite. He, God has been propitiated. He's Propitiation means this. God is saying, I ain't angry at you about your sins no more. What could be plainer than that? That's what propitiation... 
Forget the theological definitions. Let's get it down where the guy in the street can handle it. Propitiation, big word, good word. It's in the Bible. You ought to know what it means. But what it means is this in, in the nutshell. God is saying, I'm not angry at you for your sins. Relax. Don't sweat it. I took care of them. Where? At Calvary. What do you think God was doing there? And yet, so few Christians grasp this concept of God's grace, which is part. God's grace is not. Listen, I could go. I could preach three, four hours on this. This is just such good stuff. I'm, I got, didn't even get past my introduction. That's okay, and it's already been almost now. We're going to tie it up. <laughs> but we'll save it. We'll save it for another time. But listen, God's God. God's grace is so great, okay, that our sins are not an issue to him anymore. You get, you get that point? Amen. That, that's the thing that I'm trying to get. And the reason, grace is not leniency. See, and then here's another concept Christian has, Christians have. Grace is God saying, oh, don't worry about it. No, it ain't. That's not God. God's holy. He's just. He's righteous. He can't say don't worry about your sin unless he has already done something about your sin. God could not let people into heaven by a mere act of leniency say, oh, I love you all. Come on all in. Forget about your sins. Don't worry. Come on in. He couldn't do that. Why couldn't God do that? Because he's holy. He's righteous. He's just. He must punish sin. But here's the thing. Get it. He did it. What do you think the cross was about? He punished sin perfectly to satisfy himself. Not you. Himself. And then he said it's finished, paid in full. And whoever believes their sins and iniquities, I remember what? No more. And so now, even though we fail as Christians and stumble, he is saying, relax. My children, I am not angry at you for your sins. Yes, I'm going to train you and teach you, and if you need to be corrected, in love as a good father, I'm going to work in your life to try to what? Teach you how to live right. But when you stumble and fall, I'm not upset. Pick yourself up and keep going, and let me keep what working by my what? Grace. But this grace comes not because of mere what? Leniency. It comes because God did something about our sins where? At the cross. You see how this all works together? All right, you know what? We're going to take the communion this morning. I'm going to have to stop it there. But here's the one thing I would like to say as I close. If you're here today and you have not believed in Jesus Christ as your Savior, You say, I don't know if, I, if I'm ready for heaven, preacher. Listen, today I want you to understand, Jesus Christ is offering you forgiveness, eternal life, what we call salvation. You don't have to join the church. You don't have to turn over a new leaf. You don't have to promise to be what? A good person, because you can't. But I want you to understand that he's already paid for your sins. And this morning, the Bible says, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Paul was asked, remember last week's sermon? Sirs, what must I do to be what? Saved. What was the answer? Believe, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. There's nothing else you can do. God's done it all. So if you're here today and you say, I don't know if I'm ready to go to heaven. Well, you can make that decision this morning. By faith, you can believe. Do you believe this message this morning? Let me tell you something. As you're sitting here right now, you know, you may have sat here and you've heard this message and as it was being preached in your heart, you said, I believe that. Do you know that you're saved? The Bible says, If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, meaning acknowledge that he's what? The Son of God. And believe in thine what? Heart that God raised them from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So what I want to say is this. If, if you don't know if you're ready for heaven, put your trust and your faith in Jesus. It's a free gift. You can't earn it. He takes you just as you what are, and then he'll work in you 
to change you, and he can do that because of his matchless what? Grace. All right, I'm going to ask the fellas to come. Pass out the elements. We're going to take the communion, and then I'll let you go. Cincinnati on a snow white Christmas Eve Going home to see her mama and her daddy with the baby in the back seat. Fifty miles to go when she was running low on faith and gasoline It'd been a long hard year She had a lot on her mind and she didn't pay attention. She was going away too fast And before she knew what she was spinning on a thin black sheet of glass She saw both their lives flash before her eyes She didn't even have time to cry She was so scared She threw her hands up in the air If you, uh, if you want to follow along, you can just turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. <laughs> Folks, don't forget, the grace of God is free. And it comes to us because God loves us. Listen, if you're here today, you may have all kinds of troubles in life and problems. But I want to let you know something. 
the greatest problem we have is our sin. And God has done something to solve that problem. He sent His Son to the cross and He died for us so that if we will believe upon Him, when I think about the forgiveness of God, it, it truly is amazing. It's abounding grace. His grace is greater than all our sin. There's no sin, no failure too great that God's grace doesn't cover it. What good news. <laughs> Amen? Gospel means good news. Today, I want you to know that God loves you. And the proof of that love is what happened 2,000 years ago on a lonely hill in Jerusalem where the sinless, perfect Son of God allowed himself to be brutally beaten, tormented, mocked, and hung upon an old rugged cross where he gasped for every breath and suffered in agony. And with every breath, you and I were in his heart and mind. He could have summoned legions of angels to come and take him off that cross and end the pain and the suffering. But what kept him hanging there? He loved you and me. Don't you ever doubt that, folks? Our God is a God of mercy and grace and love. And I don't mind getting a little emotional about it because a man can cry. Amen. I'm man enough to stand before you and cry. Amen. And if you doubt that, let's go out in the alley after and see. <laughs> All right? But when I think of what God done for me, if God could save me, God could save anybody. Okay? And I want you to know today, don't be ashamed to come to Jesus. Don't ever be ashamed to let him know, Lord, I need you. I need your forgiveness. And he will forgive every sin. He says, their sins and iniquities I remember no more. Because of the cross, he ain't going to hold it against you. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank God he's not counting sins. Amen? Amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23. Paul writes, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. This morning as we take the bread, this represents the broken body of Christ. That means his sinless humanity which qualified him to be the what? Sacrifice. To be the true sacrifice, it had to be sinless flesh. And Jesus' body was sinless and broken for us. Let's take the bread. Verse number 25. It says, after the same manner also he took the cup. When he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, you do shew the Lord's death till he comes. This morning, as we take this cup, this represents the blood of Christ. And it was the blood of Christ that propitiated the wrath and judgment and righteous demands of God against our sin. And when we take this cup, God is reminding us, I love you. I am not holding your sins against you. He's telling us, relax. You're my child. Trust me. I have forgiven you. Let's take the cup in honor of him. Can we bow our heads? Father, this morning we're grateful and thankful to have had this time to know and to study these things from your word. And we thank you this morning for the precious gift of eternal life, the gift of your Son, the Lord Jesus, the matchless grace of God. 
Now we dedicate the last moment of the service this morning to anyone here if you're not saved. The Bible says, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Right now in the privacy of your own heart and mind between you and God and your own words, you can tell God, I know I'm a sinner. But I do believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God who died for my sins and rose again. And Lord Jesus, I'm trusting you. You alone as my Savior, my Lord. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, thou shalt be saved. Let's take a moment of silence for anyone who wishes to trust Christ. Father, this morning, if your Holy Spirit has spoken to anyone's heart, they believed in the Lord Jesus during the service. My prayer is that you would give them assurance that you've forgiven them, saved them. And Father, I pray that you'd reveal your love to their heart in a special way. And I ask that you lead them back to study your word, that they might grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And this morning I pray for the offering that you take that which is given and use it to further the teaching and the preaching of the gospel of the grace of God. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Folks, let's stand while the offering.